tonight on Nova, an international team sets out to explore one of the world's most fertile dinosaur fields. In China's vast Gobi Desert, they battle mud, heat, and sandstorms. Dynamite and paintbrushes reveal a menagerie of strange creatures from the past. Right on, another skull. Yeah. Another skull. Yeah. skull. Yeah. A vanished world comes to light on the hunt for China's dinosaurs. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. Xinjiang Province, China. Farther from the sea than anywhere else on Earth, at the western tip of the Gobi Desert in Central Asia. There is a theory that millions of years ago, this region was completely isolated, that it was part of a separate continent like Australia, and unusual dinosaurs found only in China lived, died, and left their bones in the rocks. Today, a group of scientists have come to test the theory. They are the first North American fossil hunters allowed to work here since the legendary adventurer Roy Chapman Andrews explored the Gobi in the 1920s. Andrews was a real life version of Indiana Jones. Throughout the decade, he led his team deeper into the vast desert battling the sandstorms and searing heat, warlords and bandits of Mongolia. He brought servants, table linens, a pearl-handled Colt 45, and a Hollywood cinematographer to record all the action. Andrews came looking for the first human beings. Instead, he found dinosaurs. Most notably, a new kind of plant eater named Protoceratops andrusi in his honor. Long before its work was done, Andrew's expedition was abruptly ended by political turmoil in China. But his adventures captured the imagination of millions, including Canadian scientist Phil Curry now an expert on predatory dinosaurs. Curry is co-leader of the new expedition. For me, it uh, has a special romance in a sense because my interest in paleontology started when I read a book by Roy Chapman Andrews about the Central Asiatic expeditions and coming to this region. And I never ever imagined that I would come here myself someday, but uh, I had always anticipated that I would grow up to be a paleontologist because uh, the whole notion of going to remote parts of the world to look for dinosaur skeletons uh, was so attractive to me as a child that uh, I never veered from that. It took months to persuade the Chinese authorities to allow this expedition into Xinjiang province, the heart of Asia. For decades, especially during the Cultural Revolution, Chinese dinosaur science and its specimens were covered with the dust of neglect. Only 
recently has the Chinese government considered the benefits of opening its dinosaur hunting grounds to the world. The Canadians beat out many other foreign researchers for the opportunity to explore the Gobi. They won because they offered the Chinese technical training, an invitation to work in Canada, and money. As part of the deal, these trucks bought with Canadian dollars will stay in China. Russell! Hi. I see you hiding there. <laughs> Welcome hiding. aboard. Thank you. Dale Russell, a leading dinosaur theoretician, is the other leader of the Canadians. Experts on fossil plants, fish, and insects are with the dinosaur hunters. Do you know all these people? Just, have you met Dr. Russell? They are joining their Chinese counterparts on the biggest dinosaur hunt of all time. Four years of prospecting on both sides of the Pacific. The Chinese leader is Dong Ziming, who has found the bones of more dinosaurs than anyone else in the world. I would like to express our tremendous gratitude for our, to our Chinese colleagues for allowing us to come here and to carry out a dream that we've always wanted to do, to work in the Gobi of northwestern China, where fossils are found in such abundance, and we look forward to find excellent specimens for China. Guys, well, him gao sing sai her, Let's go get them. Cheers. Cheers. The morning after. They're up at dawn to work while the blazing sun is still low in the sky. have changed since Roy Chapman Andrews called his expedition report the new conquest of Central Asia. Today, the Chinese are in charge. The desert is a mecca for fossil hunters because the bare earth makes fossils easier to see. Here, wind erosion is constantly exposing new rock layers that were deposited long ago. These rocks date back 160 million years. By then, the age of dinosaurs was already well underway. Dinosaurs first appeared 225 million years ago, when all the Earth's land was a single continent. The first dinosaurs were fierce 10-foot-long carnivores and primitive two-legged browsers twice their size. They spread to every corner of their world. By 160 million years ago, the supercontinent had split in two and then splintered further. In North America, this was the time of the giant plant-eating sauropods, often called brontosaurs, the largest animals ever to walk the earth, lumbering beasts with tiny brains. This is the period known as the Jurassic, when China may have been cut off allowing its dinosaurs to evolve in different directions from those of North America. These cliffs may hold skeletons unlike anything the Canadians have ever seen. I would like to find, dreaming in color, a sauropod skeleton, uh, just a little bit of it coming out of the ground, so I could tell if uh, the limbs were there, the, the vertebral column was there, and best of all, the skull was there. Sauropods tend to break apart when they die. These are the giant brontosaurs, and they lose their heads. 
And it's always uh, very nice to have the head connected with the rest of the skeleton because about half of the anatomy seems to be located in the head in terms of classification of these creatures. If anybody can find the ancient residents of the Gobi, it should be this crew. There are fewer than 30 full-time dinosaur paleontologists in the world, and three of them are here. There, today, you must be take the scapula. Okay. Dong Ji Ming has the most practiced eye. He's dug dinosaurs for 40 years and personally supervises all Chinese dinosaur digging. Dong Ji Ming is just a superb field man. Dale Russell's sort of on the other end of the, the scale, and uh, he's, he's the thinker of the three of us, and he's the one who develops the ideas. Um, whereas I would say that uh, Dong Ming and myself tend to be people who test those ideas more than anything else. Fossil finding is still as much an art as a science. When you've been at it for a while, uh, you develop a search image and it, it's automatic. Um, you can be walking along thinking about something on the other side of the world entirely. And uh, your eyes will catch just a glint of bone or just the right shape in the rock. And uh, suddenly it fires something in your head and you shut out everything else you've been thinking about and then you focus on that piece of bone. But for weeks, the dinosaurs remain hidden. It wouldn't be the first time that top experts return from a promising site with nothing to show but sunburns and desert souvenirs. It's a horse, guys. It's the only one. It's the right end of the horse, though. Congratulations. <laughs> Is that well, all you could find? Yeah, better days, huh? <laughs> What did you get? Well, I guess that's it, guys. They're going to send us back now. Finally, after three frustrating weeks, a Chinese scientist spots a huge hunk of bone. Look up here. What is that? Like that must be a humongous rib. Rib. It's a rib. Not rib. Uh huh. Boy, it's rib big. For, uh, Look at the, uh, yes. Yeah. But very, very, very sharp. Yeah. This animal, I think, belong to Sarapod. Yeah. Right back on Yeah. What else could it be? It's uh -huh. a size like that. Those are supposed to be circles. But most of the skeleton lies buried under 100 tons of solid rock. The Canadians fear the blasting will destroy fossils, but the Chinese feel it's a risk worth taking to save time. With a few pounds of explosives and a lot of muscle, the team removes rock that took millions of years to form. bizarre giant begins to emerge from the rock. The thin rope-like shape is the edge of a chain of neck bones as long as a bus. They once belonged to a plant eater, a sauropod called a mementosaur. It was a hundred feet in length, with the longest neck of any animal that has ever lived. It's 30 meter in long. That maybe it's new. Maybe it's a new genus. It's a new genus and species. But we uh, very large. Maybe I think it is in Asia the largest sauropod. 
And it's the first sauropod dinosaur that I've ever had the privilege of working on because sauropods don't occur in Canada. And uh, we're working into the quarry face now, looking for hopefully a head. It seems like one of the rules of life, which might be called Russell's Law, is that the head of the dinosaur is never preserved. Or at least it's very seldom preserved, so we're hoping mightily. Against all odds, against all reason. Sauropods aren't found in Canada because the surface rocks there are the wrong age. But dozens of sauropods have turned up farther south, from Montana to South America. The question is, how closely does this Chinese mementosaur resemble its relatives in other parts of the ancient world? If it's different, that's evidence for the lost continent theory, which predicts that Chinese dinosaurs of this era were isolated and distinct. Finding a skull here could settle the issue. Skulls contain vital clues for retracing an animal's ancestry, but they are as rare as they are valuable. No one has ever found a mementosaur skull. The basic problem is, is that skulls tend to be quite fragile. And in all probability, some of the carnivorous dinosaurs were starting to eat at the front of the body and working their way back. And once they got full, they left. So um, destruction by carnivores is another way of eliminating the heads and would be quite crunchy. <laughs> but uh, whether they, in fact, uh, enjoyed the heads because they were a delicacy, we don't really know. After a month of working with everything from dynamite to toothbrushes, the team has dug out only 10 feet of the neck and most of the tail. They will have to leave in three weeks, and the skull, if it's there, remains buried deep. But the rest of the skeleton is still a treasure. The giant's leg and the ribs are dug out and prepared for transport out of the desert. Okay. What we're planning on doing, we've just finished excavating around the specimen. Um, we've, we've created a trench, and we're getting ready to cover it over with a separator layer of paper. And then we're going to put uh, plaster and burlap bandages on it. Uh, eventually, once those are hard, we'll turn it over and plaster the other side, and the block will be ready to be transported out of here. Eat up. That, that plaster will start to set up in a minute. The plaster will protect the fragile bone on the bumpy truck ride back to the museum. Okay. There it will be removed, and the rest of the rock will be chipped away from the fossil. It can take 15,000 hours to dig out and reassemble one large dinosaur. Progress is slow and sweaty. At midday, a thermometer would register 120 degrees in the shade, if there were any shade. In the overheated imagination of a bone digger, the mementosaur comes to life. and it's got some nasty company. The ancient environment was very different from today's parched desert. In the hot dust, the team finds the bones of a crocodile, evidence that there was plenty of water when the dinosaurs were here.
This is the edge of the eye socket there. You can tell it's crocodile partly because of all those pits are uh, characteristic for crocodiles. We're getting uh, bits and pieces of most of the skeleton, like proximal ends of the limb bones and uh, parts of the vertebral column, parts of the skull. So I suspect that once we finish, we'll have maybe 60, 70 percent of the animal represented. It'll be like a giant jigsaw puzzle. The 160 million year old puzzle is pieced together for the expedition's cook, Lao Jung. Oh, see if any of these shafts match me. Gorgeous leg. After a long day of digging, there are tired bones and growling stomachs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The season is winding down. The Mementosaur skull is still out of reach. And with just two weeks left, a very different creature is discovered nearby. I wonder if that's a tarsal. Probably not. You know, that could be, Philip, above that, that could be the, uh, the distal end of the tibia. Huh? Oh, that's beautiful. Really nice. The bones belong to a carnivorous dinosaur, a theropod. But it's a new kind of theropod, never seen before. This type of dinosaur is a relatively primitive version of Tyrannosaurus rex and uh, would have weighed somewhere in the vicinity of one and a half to two tons. Walked on his hind legs, very large teeth, very large claws, and been quite ferocious at the time. You can see the lower leg bones, the tibia and the fibula, coming out of the hillside. And these bones are extremely rare. They're not found very often in specimens, especially this well-preserved. And these are ankle bones. They fit very nicely right on the end of the, um, the leg bone, simply because everything isn't badly crushed. The bones of the foot are also well-preserved. You can see uh, these are the metatarsals. And we have a number of phalanges already from this quarry. Um, that is toe bones, and quite a few of the claws as well. This animal may have been the Mementosaurus tormentor. It's much more husky than the carnivores of North America, more evidence that evolution in China was going its own way. What's been found here already are the hind limbs, parts of the front limbs, and enough bone to indicate that probably the whole skeleton is in the hillside right now. So many dinosaurs, so little time. Once again, the animal's skull may be buried too deep. The specimen, unfortunately, was found uh, rather late in the season. So we're now faced with a bit of a dilemma in the sense that uh, it may, there may not be enough time right now to take the whole specimen out this year. In that case, we would uh, excavate the parts that we safely feel we can excavate this year and leave the rest for next year when we return again. We've just, just really, literally touched the surface. We haven't the time. It's getting cold now and the winds are coming up. We haven't got very many days left. I regret that because I wished we could have pulled that theropod skull out of the ground. I don't think we will now.
But there's an unexpected last-minute triumph. Most team members have already left when the great head of the carnivore is discovered and extracted. Four-inch teeth still gleaming in the ferocious mouth. Its flattened nose and other peculiar skull features confirm that this animal was very different from predators in the rest of the world. But they're all gone on this side. Three years later, a Chinese crew finally reached the Mementosaur skull. They reported that it did not resemble any North American sauropod. Two old skulls pulled from the desert rocks have provided crucial evidence that China was a world apart during the middle of the age of dinosaurs. But would it always be so? Would North American and Chinese dinosaurs follow their separate paths right to the end of their days on Earth? In the final age of dinosaurs, China rejoined Asia. A hundred million years ago, North America met Asia near the North Pole, forming a land bridge which the dinosaurs could have crossed, ending their isolation. This was the Cretaceous, the time of the Tyrannosaur, the most terrifying predator that ever lived. It dined on duckbills and horned dinosaurs. To find proof, that these dinosaurs used the Arctic passageway, the Chinese and Canadian scientists flew to Bylet Island, high in northern Canada. The Chinese were as eager to prospect in Canada as the Canadians were to dig in the Gobi. But without fur, how could dinosaurs have survived in the frozen north? The answer is that it wasn't frozen then. The shapes and sizes of fossil leaves point to rainy and mild weather, like today's Oregon coast. It was different in those days. For sure, there was no, no ice and snow. So the dinosaurs probably, some of them anyway, would have come north uh, with the polar spring. And maybe the young ones came here because the, uh, the plant vegetation would have been luxuriant with 24-hour daylight. And it must have been quite exceptional. It was an Arctic paradise for the plant eaters of the time. But some things never change. Weeks of searching the bleak hills turn up only a handful of duckbill dinosaur bones. But that's enough to show the dinosaurs were here. Uh, this is the first jaw, hadrosaur jaw, that we found this far north. So it's a very small hadrosaur. The teeth are running up in a battery along here. They're just the two sockets.
future expeditions will take up the quest in the Arctic. Meanwhile, this crew will look for indirect evidence of dinosaur migration, pursuing the globe-trotting dinosaurs of the Cretaceous farther south in Canada, and finally back in China. If closely related animals are found on both sides of the Pacific, they must have crossed up north. This is Phil Curry's home turf, the badlands of Alberta. These beautiful sediments were laid down about 80 million years ago, near the dramatic end of the age of dinosaurs. In those days, Alberta was warm and wet, something like Florida today. Rocks from earlier in the age of dinosaurs lie deep underground. But the younger surface layers have produced a bonanza of fascinating fossils from the last flowering of dinosaur life. The bones suggest that the last dinosaurs were sophisticated animals with complex social behavior, a far cry from the dumb brutes of the Mementosaurs' day, 80 million years earlier. At this site, a rich mine of fossils has convinced Curry that some dinosaurs must have been long distance travelers. He and his co-workers have dug here for a decade, extracting thousands of bones. All belong to a single species of horn dinosaur, Centrosaurus. Everything still seems to indicate a mass death. Mm. Anywhere from um, 80 animals is what we have now. There's probably 400 animals in here. What? 400. 400. All Open the up. same species. Yeah. Cleanly broken bones suggest many of these dinosaurs were trampled alive in a panic stampede. Curry has a theory about what may have happened based on modern herding animals like wildebeests. Well, the explanation we had for this bone bed is, is that a herd of centrosaurs tried to cross a river in flood and that a lot of these animals drowned. And it sounds like a rather spectacular explanation until you look into the uh, recent fossil record and, and as well at modern animals. And you start finding that large herding animals run into trouble frequently. It's happening all the time. Uh, as individuals, they can swim quite well. So as long as it was one going across the river at a time, they're okay. But as soon as a herd started going across, it's a different game altogether. They started fouling each other up uh, forcing each other underwater, and of course it also introduces mass panic. This may be what the bone bed looked like 80 million years ago, in the aftermath of a prehistoric tragedy. Curry believes that this ill-fated herd must have been migrating because they quickly would have run out of food if the herd had stayed in one place. If you're talking about one four-ton individual, uh, it's going to have quite an effect on any, any ecosystem. But when you start talking herds of four or 500 animals, uh, all weighing about the same, then you start feeling that it's, it's unlikely that any ecosystem could sustain that many animals for very long. Another site, also in Alberta, provides a window onto a different kind of social behavior, parenting. There are hundreds of fossilized dinosaur nests here, where Curry and his co-workers have found embryos still in their eggs, tiny dinosaurs which never saw the sun. Yeah. Oh, it's a bug, yeah? Yeah, that's it, embryo. In terms of uh, the excitement of finding something, it was the, the biggest high I've probably had in my, my professional career. Uh, it, was, it was tremendous. We were just like a bunch of little kids when we started picking up these little tiny uh, embryonic bones uh, from the surface of the ground and realized what they were. The nests belong to duck-billed dinosaurs like the ones in the Arctic. Though the fossil evidence is sketchy, these nests evoke a picture of what it was like to grow up dinosaur. 
Besides embryos, the nests contain bones of hatchlings, suggesting that parents fed their young and tried to protect them from predators. It was a dangerous world for babies. The teeth of a cunning predator named Troodon have been found inside some of the nests. This drawer contains most of the world's collection of Troodon. This is its brain case, discovered in Canada by a Chinese member of the dinosaur expedition. It held a brain three times larger, relative to body size, than any other dinosaur brain. The brain extends all the way from the back of the skull here, right through this region, uh, with the optic lobes um, centered right about this section right here. So there would have been a little bit more of the brain case covering over this part of the brain, but that's, that's a large brain for an animal that's supposed to be um, quite stupid. Uh, the brain size of Troodon is relatively larger than any of the mammals that lived at the same time as this dinosaur, but even compared to many modern mammals and birds, uh, this is a respectable brain size. This is the lush world of Cretaceous Canada, as seen through the eyes of Troodon. In Cretaceous Canada, dinosaurs had come a long way. But did these sophisticated creatures have their roots across the sea in China? The expedition is headed back to the Gobi Desert to continue its hunt for the last dinosaurs. They were smart, adaptable animals with complex social behavior. If they crossed a land bridge between Asia and North America, dinosaurs much like those of North America should turn up here in China. This time, the scientists are going to the Eastern Gobi because the sediments there are the same age as the rocks of Canada. Their destination is near the Mongolian border the same region Roy Chapman Andrews explored. It's 1,000 miles east of where the Mementosaur swung its thin neck millions of years earlier. Curry would love to find an actual site where Andrews pitched his tents, but that won't be easy. You can see that there is two major valleys, one and the, and the With geologist one. Tom Jerzykiewicz, he tries to reconcile the maps Andrews made with new American satellite photos of the remote Gobi. It's just along the one side, um, although I've heard that there are similar escarpments. The Chinese authorities will not provide maps of this militarily sensitive border region. The town of Ehrenhaut is the end of the line and the beginning of the quest. Somewhere in this vast desert, Andrew's team made its first dinosaur discovery. They had found one of China's best fossil bearing areas. Since then, the Chinese have dug up dozens of skeletons here. Many of the bones look familiar to the Canadians. They have seen closely related animals back in Canada, where they lived in swamps. But this area of China was very different. Even in the Cretaceous, it was almost as arid as it is today. Uh -huh. 
Among the finds are the bones of duckbills, already found in the Arctic and all over Canada. One misshapen leg bone tells Canadian Kevin Allenback a remarkable story of pain and perseverance. Well, what we have here is uh, the fibula off a duckbill dinosaur. And what's interesting about this one in this bone bed is that uh, it has a fracture through it right here, which uh, happened when the animal was alive and fused up again. And you can actually see the line of shear coming through here. Okay, so this, this actually was broken clean right, right in half. And then the animal, uh, through walking on this broken leg, has caused uh, the bone to, to shift. And then one end slowly fused in by building up calcium bridge across. And the same with the other end. So you've got this bone which has this incredible twist to it. It must have been quite the blow to, to break the leg like this. Uh, it just makes you wonder, like, uh, these animals aren't as supreme as they may seem. Even though they're 28 feet long, they still suffer from all the ailments that you or I could suffer from. They still get the parasites, the disease, the broken bones from their environment. And it just makes them seem more human. Maybe the drink of the beer, you know? The beer. Deng Zhiming comes up with a different kind of treasure. The wheat? Yeah, the drivers. Yeah. Oh, the drivers, yeah. Yeah, drivers? Yeah. So. Litter from an Andrews Expedition campsite beer bottles, and a tin drinking cup etched with a Model T car. For the new expedition, the quest leads 300 difficult miles onward to a desolate canyon land mysteriously named Bayan Mandahu, Rich Wood. Satellite maps suggest it has great rock formations which should be rich in dinosaurs, but there are no guarantees. <laughs> Gobi means sand but most of it is rocky plains, where trails turn to gullies of mud with the sudden spring rains. Andrew struggled to make his way through, but impassable terrain finally turned his caravan back. These explorers press on into unknown territory. At last, Bayan Mandahu. Curry is awestruck and hopeful. There's, there's just so much desert here, and the rocks just go on forever. This is where the Mongolian hordes came from that conquered much of the world uh, in the time of Genghis Khan. And uh, fossil-wise, you have uh, tremendous exposures of rock in the desert. And if you have tremendous exposures of rock, you have a very good chance, provided the rocks are of the right age and the dinosaurs happen to be living in this area and so on, of finding the remains of those animals. The expedition's gamble pays off. Poking in the soft sand, the team comes upon a rare prize, a baby dinosaur. Here, look at this. There's a, ph a phalanx, a head, and a distal end there? Oh, okay, you know which one that is? Yeah, the one that you have on the thing. Yeah, that's yeah. the second. Yeah. Hmm. Look, look, that's the, uh, the raptorial one. Yeah. Look oh, at, look at yeah. the joint. Oh, wow. This is an important find, so because these there. bones belong to an animal almost identical to a Canadian predator which Curry knows very well. Yeah, a head, uh, phalanx, and then a uh, distal. That first one, the whole family. So the whole the family. family. Okay. Nothing to touch it. Great. Just need to get another beer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll give you two. 
But that's that's especially nice to get that one. Yeah. One of the nicest surprises this year already has been uh, the discovery of what was first thought to be a bird, but is very clearly uh, an animal that's very closely related to one of our Alberta forms called Troodon. And this particular animal called Sornithoides is uh, not particularly well known. In the evening, Curry assembles the small limb bones of this Asian version of Troodon, the intellectual giant of its time. We know that this particular group of dinosaurs had in fact uh, turned the thumb around so the thumb was facing the next two main fingers, which is unusual because uh, many of the dinosaurs, things like Tyrannosaurids, for example, have lost that ability completely, so they only have two fingers that are used as grappling hooks in all probability. This dinosaur not only had the high intelligence, but he had the hands that he could manipulate his prey and move it around because he could hold it like this. The fossil hunters soon discover what the Asian Troodon may have had for its last dinner. A little digging uncovers a domestic scene from the past. The explorers find at least five different types of shell, long and round, thick and thin. A chance of fitting a specimen like this in, which has obviously been crushed. Well, not on these ones, I don't think, because these... What do you think about that? Well, I don't think that's going to work. Here, you want to try that? I, I've tried a, a few different ways. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. Allenbeck faces the daunting task of piecing the thick shell fragments together. Reconstructing a single egg may take him three months. It's just amazing, even with all the crystal growth, how just how thick these eggshells are. It must have been an awful strong embryo to break out of these things. Oh, it must have had an egg tooth like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. The Andrews expedition discovered the first dinosaur eggs, and they caused a sensation. One egg was auctioned for $5,000. The auction angered the Chinese and helped get Andrews banned from returning to China. Three, four, five, six. Today's hunters find a prize that eluded Andrews, the tiniest dinosaur skull ever found, a fetal protoceratops. I think they're both dinosaur yeah. Hundreds of other fossils are collected. In a week, Bayan Mandahu has gone from unknown wilderness to the richest fossil locality in Asia. What environment supported this ancient community? Paleontologist Paul Johnston has found clues in the burrows of ancient insects. When we look, we see, for instance, tubes like this. And we, think, we might think at first, oh, those are just uh, root traces. Ancient roots uh, probably came down into this, this sand and uh, perhaps they rotted away and, left, and leave kind of a, a cast of where they once were. But when we look at the internal structure of some of these tubes, we can see a layering inside and the layers don't go straight across they're cupped so they're stacked cupped layers like this and that kind of internal structure is very typical for animals that burrow the evidence suggests that this area 80 million years ago was very much like it is today a community of small animals hanging on to a precarious existence in the sand The desert is not an easy place for modern humans either. A sandstorm blows up with little warning. storms that last for days, it gets very depressing after a while, because there's not much you can do. You just uh, hover in your tent and try and hold it together, because you can't go out in it, uh, you can't work. It's almost impossible to find fossils in a situation like this. Wind storms that begin here 
will turn the skies of Beijing a thousand miles away, orange with Gobi dust. And even fiercer storms swept through here long ago, as the scientists are about to discover. Shreds of bone near a cliffside lead to the skull of a baby armored dinosaur called an ankylosaur, a type that also lived in ancient Canadian swamps. Then two more baby skulls are found huddled close together. Almost looks as if um, you know, they got caught in something pretty sudden. I mean, it wasn't a watering hole, obviously, or something that dried up and they just died together. It looks like they were buried or, or something. Yeah. Slump or a storm or something like that? I would guess a storm. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. Oh. This cold, right? Yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, do you see? <laughs> I think you got another skull. That's your next baby curled up. That's nice. It's something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Skull. Yeah, right on. Another skull. Yeah. Another skull. Yeah. Skull. Yeah. So that body's curled right up, eh? Right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, this do you see? here. Yeah. Just smooth up here. Yeah. Oh, and then you're coming into oh, this yeah, stuff yeah. here, down here. Mm. Okay. Nice. Mm. Go. Oh, okay. Good. good show. <laughs> right on. Number four. Beer. 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 <laughs> Mai Tai. Mai Tai. Right no, 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 no. This is probably all one body then, do you think, Phil? Curled up? Today, we realized that one of the reasons we couldn't sort out what was going on in this quarry was simply because we weren't dealing with one animal at all. We were dealing with several. And in a very short space of time, we found that we had not one skull, but three skulls. And uh, since this morning, two more have turned up. So it appears now what we're looking at is we have a mass death site of at least five individuals of dinosaurs that are all about the same age. And what that indicates is that we're also looking at um, perhaps a group of dinosaurs that have been growing up together. To Curry, the skulls tell the tragic story of a group of youngsters, perhaps a family, that met its end in the treacherous, shifting sands of the desert. It's possible that these dinosaurs were clustered together seeking refuge from one of the sandstorms that still rips through this region very regularly and were either buried by the sand coming over the top of the dune and, and therefore smothered, or perhaps um, a massive slump from the top of the sand dune that just buried them all. Another season is ending. There's not much time left. And the final detailed work of picking stone away from bone can be done in a lab. But Kevin Allenback can't wait to get started. It gets its own character as you go along. Uh, this guy, he's got a bit of a hair lip, as you can see. Uh, quite the overbite. Missing a few teeth, sort of like Popeye. Eh, and the old <laughs> sideways squint to it. Uh, yeah, they, they get their own personality after a while. Every skull's different. If you look at the one in front, uh, he's got a bit of a protruding jaw. Looks kind of Cro-Magnon. <laughs> this one's a lot better. <laughs> this is more feminine. This one, a she, <laughs> that a he. <laughs> I have, I have little things in my head. <laughs> oh, can I tell that's a girl? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> It's just a personality you impart upon your specimen. <laughs> we will never know whether this baby dinosaur that suffocated in the hot sand millions of years ago was a boy or a girl. But these ancient bones have added rich detail to our picture of the versatile animals that dominated the Earth for 140 million years. The bones are evidence that in the final age of dinosaurs, some were world travelers, equally at home in desert and swamp, in Gobi heat and Arctic chill. Yet they were all wiped out. It's one of the many dinosaur mysteries still unexplained. But the quest to understand these magnificent creatures goes on all over the world.
Funding for NOVA is provided by Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry and the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to this address or call 212-227-READ.